How's everybody doing this morning? It is so good to see you. We are glad to be here. Welcome to First Baptist Church, our morning worship service. Thank you for making this a part of your week and your weekend. And we hope that you are blessed uh, by what you hear, what you see, and what's going on, and what you get to be a part of this morning. So we're excited to have you here if you're visiting here. Uh, For the first time, or if it's been a long time since you've been here, we want to say welcome to you. You are a very special guest to us. We want you to take a few moments sometimes during the course of this service, if you haven't done so already, and fill out one of our visitor information cards and hand that to me on your way out. I'd love to meet you and talk to you and uh, just get to know you a little bit better. So we are looking forward to what's coming up in the month of October. Your calendars are in the bulletin. Uh, We are anxiously awaiting several events this week, uh, this month. Uh, Tomorrow, we're going to go to Nichols State at the BCM, and we're going to feed the students there. Uh, They're predicting anywhere between 80 and 100 students. So if you would like to go with that, the food is already being prepared. Uh, We have everything ready. We just need the hands and feet to go. We need the smiling faces to welcome the students. Uh, We have some friends from Dry Creek Baptist Camp. They're going to be there with us. They're going to be recruiting Uh, people to go and serve at their camp next summer and so uh, if you want to come be a part of that let us know we'll let you know today what time we'll be heading out tomorrow for the campus uh, to feed them our fall food roundup is going on right now many of you have brought uh, items to send to the Louisiana Baptist Children's Home you have until Tuesday morning to get that in you can bring it back tonight Uh, you can bring it tomorrow when the office opens or Tuesday morning they'll be coming by uh, sometime during the day on Tuesday to pick that up and bring it to Monroe to the children's home. Uh, many other things going on. Check your calendar. One, I want you to make sure that you do not miss out on. Uh, we have some invitations like this. Uh, they're out in the foyer. They're here up front. I have some on the pews. We're going to have a time of prayer over these. Friend Day is coming up on October the 22nd. This is an opportunity for you to reach out to your lost friends, neighbors, loved ones, anybody in your family, anybody that you know that is not connected with a church or anybody that you know that does not have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're looking for. We're going to start off at 9 a.m. It says this on the card. We're going to have coffee and donuts, a time to meet and greet. I want to meet your friends as you bring them if they choose to come to Sunday school. And then we'll begin Sunday school at 930. And then before the worship service, we'll have another brief time of meet and greet. Not only that, uh, it it gets better, but wait, there's more. Uh, We're going to give you more of an opportunity. That evening, we're going to come back 5 o'clock, and we're going to begin a time of fellowship. Uh, we got some guys that want to barbecue some chicken. We're going to ask that you bring side items and desserts uh, to help out with that. So we're just going to come back that evening. If they they don't choose to come on Sunday morning, uh, you know, whatever offer you make them, if you're going to cook lunch for them or take them out to eat after church, Uh, You know, if you want to sweeten the pot a little bit more and say, hey, look, you can come back and have a time of fellowship with us as well. You can bring them back that evening as well. We would love to see you with your family and friends here on October the 22nd. So take these invites and use them as an opportunity to reach out to those around you. Uh, Ladies, you have a fellowship coming up on October the 28th. Uh, Miss Tara Dew from New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary will be here as the guest speaker. Uh, Lunch will be provided, 11 to 1. Uh, This is also another opportunity for you to reach out to people in our neighborhood and our surrounding areas. This is an associational event, so people throughout St. Mary Parish, other churches will be here as well. Uh, Men, I'm going to need a little help on that day. Uh, We're going to serve the ladies. We want them to come and enjoy the day. Uh, The meal is going to be prepared. All we have to do is heat things up, put it on a plate, and serve the ladies that day and then clean up afterwards so they can enjoy their time of fellowship on that day. So find something that you can be a part of. Uh, Many other things going on. I know I didn't cover it all. Uh, We have an associational meeting coming up on October the 10th. Uh, That will be in Baldwin. Uh, That's also in the bulletin as well. Uh, Louisiana Baptist Convention is coming up in November. Uh, we're looking further down the road at January uh, and February. we got uh, our evangelism conference for the state coming up in January. And then we will have our own revival the first week of February. Brother Sam Moore is coming back. We have a musical group, Broken Vessels. Tori Dardar and his family, they are from around this area. They will be here leading us in music. So we are looking forward to what's going on. Plenty of opportunity for you to do 
personal evangelism and outreach because here we're going to lift up the name of Jesus. And here's what Jesus said in John chapter 12. Jesus said, if I were to be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. So that's what we want to do in this worship service this morning. We want to lift up the mighty and powerful name of Jesus so that he will be exalted, he will be honored, he will be worshiped, and when that happens, people will be drawn to the gospel. Let's all stand. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. We'll continue with our time of worship. I'm excited about the message that the Lord has for me today. I hope that you will take it to heart. I hope you'll listen to these songs because they go just they go along with the theme for today. Uh, we want to reach out. We want to tell people that the Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I don't know what situation you have in your life. I don't know what's going on in your heart right now. But whatever it is, God wants to reach down. He wants to touch you and he wants to lift you up out of that situation. Father God, we love you so much and we thank you for all that you're doing. Lord, this is the day that you have made. And God, we're going to rejoice and we're going to be glad in it. Lord God, nothing is going to steal my joy away today. No circumstance, nothing around me, Lord God, am I going to let keep me from worshiping you right now. Because Lord, you even said that if, that if we don't worship you, that you would even make the rocks cry out. Lord, I don't want no rock crying out for me. I don't want no rock taking my place in the role of worshiping you. So right now, Lord God, I just pray that we'll open up our hearts, that we'll open up our minds, Lord God, that we'll clear our minds of everything that's going on around us, and we'll just see you exalted and lifted up, Lord God. We turn this time over to you, Lord God. We ask that you'll do with it what only you can do, that your Holy Spirit would fill this place with his power and his presence and touch and change lives. And we just ask it all in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Find somebody right now that you haven't said hello to yet. Shake their hand and say, look, I am glad that you are here today.
Peter and John were ordinary <laughs> men, unschooled. They realized that Peter and John had been with Jesus. When people meet you out on the street, in the grocery store, in the office, in the shop, at work, wherever, can they tell you've been with Jesus? Listen, if we don't let others know about Jesus, if they can't see Jesus living through us, we're missing it. So think about this as we sing this song. Let others see Jesus in you.
falling in line, and if you don't believe Jesus is coming back, talk to me. Talk to me, to the pastor. Talk to some of these Sunday school teachers around here. He's coming. He's coming. And I hope that you will consider this as you go through this next week. Ask the Lord right now. An offering to him. We're fixing to have the offering. Right? An offering to him. Set my soul afire. You know, if each one of us had a fire burning in us and we went out and shared the gospel with one person, with one person, how would that affect our attendance? How would that affect the kingdom? And that's really what it's all about, affecting the kingdom of God. He will set your soul afire.
continue to lead our church in the direction you'd have us to go, be with Brother Tracy as he leads us. God direct us in everything that we do. These things we ask for your name. Amen. I hope you can honestly say that today. I hope that in your life that that is your goal, is for others to see Jesus lifted up in everything that you say and in everything that you do. Uh, tonight, if you come back at 6 o'clock, we have been talking about victories, uh, different victories in the Old Testament. Uh, we will be wrapping that up. We're going to talk about small steps leading to a big victory tonight. I hope you'll join us for that. On Wednesday nights, we are going through the book of the Acts of the Apostles. We are wrapping that up as well. Paul is on his final um, journey. He's about to be shipwrecked. So if you can join us on Wednesday nights, that's what we're studying on. Uh, hopefully on Sunday nights, before too much longer, we're going to enter into a book. Uh, we're going to study the book of Galatians. Uh, that's where we're headed there. Uh, back in 
uh, July, I guess, uh, week 13, open our ears, Lord. I, I never would have dreamed uh, that we would have taken it this far, but here we are. And I, I feel like we're just getting started on this whole thing. I, I feel like we've learned so much. I, th I feel like there's so much still yet to learn. But here's the thing. When you do learn how to hear from the Lord, uh, when you begin walking closer and closer with Him, uh, there's a little bit of a responsibility added to that. It, it comes with an obligation. Not, not only once you hear the Lord are you blessed in your own life, but then you are obligated to do something about what He is saying to you. We talked about the prophet Jeremiah last week. We're going to talk about the prophet Ezekiel this week. Uh, Ezekiel 33 is our passage where we're at. Uh, he had a message to bring to the people. It was basically at the same time uh, that Jeremiah had brought his message of judgment from the Lord. So here's the thing. These prophets, uh, all they were obligated to do was to deliver the message. Once they delivered the message, the ball was in everyone else's court. They were no longer held responsible because they did what they were obligated to do. They did what the Lord had called them to do. Several months ago, earlier this year, uh, I hadn't been to a, a general physician here in a while. I haven't had my blood work done. I knew I was off of some medication. I wasn't feeling real bad, but I knew it was time to get established with a home doctor. I went and got my blood work done, all the little tests that he wanted before our office visit. And uh, when I went into the office that day, it was not good news. <laughs> My doctor definitely had a message for me, not only a verbal message, but he had a visual message for me as well. Uh, he took this sheet of paper, and he was just kind of shaking his head, and he was just real blunt about it. He said, Mr. Smith, he said, I don't know how you get out of bed in the morning. He said, you're a ticking time bomb. And whenever he showed me the paperwork, uh, there was more stuff on it highlighted <laughs> that was out of spec than was in range. So he said, if you don't do something about this, you're going to be out of my hands and you're going to be in the hands of a cardiologist. It's hereditary. Uh, it's something I knew that I dealt with and it's something that I knew that I wasn't taking care of. But he had a crystal clear message for me on that day. Now, when he got all these results in and when I went into the office, he had two options. He could either say nothing, make a lot of money off of me, bring me on to the cardiologist because I didn't do something to correct this. He could have just remained silent about it. But he said, I know that this guy can do something about this problem here. He said, I know that we can work on this. I know that he has options on taking care of this. So he sat down with me and he said, here's what you need to do. Here's what needs to happen. Here's the warning that I'm giving to you because I care about you, I'm concerned. He did his part, and then it was up to me. I could say, you know what, Doc? These numbers are wrong. Your machine's out of whack. I don't believe it, and I'm not going to do anything about it. Doc, you did your part. I thank you for it. Here's the money I owe you. Thank you for taking time with me, but I choose not to do anything with this warning that you've given to me about my health, but that was not the option I took. I took his words to heart. I've seen people that this has happened to. My grandfather had quadruple bypass open heart surgery. He was one of the pioneers in the field. Dr. DeBakey back in Lake Charles, uh, kind of experimenting with that and getting it started. He was one of the first ones that that happened to in that area. I, I knew that I had an aunt that had a massive heart attack at a young age and died, so I said, I've got to do something about this situation. So the next time I went back, there was about half as many highlighted spots. I was watching what I ate. I was taking the right medication, and I started exercising. My weight went down. All of the numbers got back in line. So I took his warning, his instructions to heart, and I said, I've got to do something about this. Folks, let me tell you something. I'm going to be real blunt about it. This world that we're in right now, it's a ticking time bomb. It's got a short fuse on it, and it's about to blow. I think we're reaching the end of the age. I think the world as we know it is going to come to an abrupt end pretty soon. I believe that Jesus is coming back just like he said he would. Hey, look, he said he would, he would go to the cross. He would die. He would be buried for three days. He would rise again. 
But he also told his disciples, he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back again and receive you to myself. That's a promise from the Lord that one of these days, the church, God's children, those who have been washed by the blood of the Lamb, those who are saved will be snatched up out of this earth and will rise to meet Jesus in the air. In this world as we know it, it's going to be literally hell on earth. You don't want to be here when that happens. Amen? So we look at here at, at, at a prophet. He's talking about a sword of judgment falling upon the land. And he's giving the people of Judah and Jerusalem and Israel a crystal clear warning. He says, folks, your time is limited. God is about to bring judgment on you. As a matter of fact, at the time that this prophecy was made, they were already in captivity. Jerusalem was under siege. King Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonian Empire had taken them into custody. And his grip was drawing closer and tighter and tighter during the time that the prophet Ezekiel wrote this message. This is probably one of the most relatable images that Ezekiel used in all of his prophecy. The image he used is that of a watchman on a wall. In other words, there's a security guard up on the wall. He's watching for the enemy. And that's what God called Ezekiel during his book. He says, I'm placing you as a watchman on the wall that when you see danger coming, you need to warn the people and let them know that it's time to get ready because the end is coming near. So each and every one of you here, you don't pay the preacher to go out and do the, all the evangelism. I'm just going to be up front about it and what my message is about. Evangelism is not just the job of myself or any other minister in a church. Evangelism is the job of every person here who claims to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. No matter how you do it, he didn't give specific instructions of how to do it. He said, you just got to do it. You've got to go out and warn people that there is a judgment coming, that a life lived without the Lord Jesus Christ is not a life that you want to live, and you certainly don't want to die apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. The most relatable image used by Ezekiel, used throughout his book, is that of a watchman on a wall. Ezekiel was very, very serious about his messages. He was very, very blunt with them. He was a, a countryman. He loved his country. He loved the nation. And he wanted nothing more than to see his nation turn around and repent and turn to the Lord. How serious was he about preaching these messages to the Lord? If you look through his book, if you read the entire thing, you'll see in chapter 24, verse 18, something happens significantly in his life. Ezekiel says this. He says, during the day I preached to the people just like the Lord had told me to do. He said, in, that, in the evening, at that night, my wife died. Think about that for just a minute. The most precious person to him had died in the evening. The one that he loved dearly had passed away. And what did he do? Did he turn his back on the Lord? No. He said, in the morning I preached to the people. At night, my wife died. The next day, I preached to the people just like the Lord had told me to. Because he knew that God had appointed him as a watchman on the wall with a crystal clear warning to give to the people of Jerusalem and Judah. Let's all stand for the reading of the word out of honor and reverence of the scriptures. Well, what does that say about us today? What does that have to do with us and what we are to do in the area of evangelism? Let's see what the Bible has to say in Ezekiel chapter 33, beginning verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring the sword upon a land... And the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman when he sees the sword coming upon the land. If he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. 
He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees a sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Therefore you, O son of man, say to the house of Israel, Thus you say, if our transgressions and our sins lie upon us, and we pine away in them, how can we then live? Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Did you get that part? Somebody should be saying amen to that. That shows the degree of God's mercy and his grace and his love for his creation, mankind. He goes as far to say, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God doesn't want to see anyone perish. God doesn't want to see you die in a sinful state. God doesn't want to see our culture pine away, as he described here, in their iniquities and their sins. God specifically says that he has no pleasure in that. Peter writes in his epistle that God is long-suffering towards us, and he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked... Turn from his way and live. Turn. Turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Is there someone here in this building today that needs to turn from their wicked lifestyle and say, God, I surrender to you. I hear the message. I hear the warning. And now I want to do something about it. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. God, I thank you for this message. I thank you that you give us chance after chance and opportunity after opportunity to respond to the gospel. And God, I didn't, if, 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 God, if I didn't believe that there was someone here that you need to say, then I wouldn't be here, Lord. If I didn't believe that there was someone here that needed to hear the story of your love and your mercy and your grace, Lord God, I would just be wasting my breath. But God, I truly believe that there is still power in the blood. I believe that your life was laid down for many to come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior. And I believe, Lord God, that you sent me here during this time in Morgan City to preach the good news and declare the acceptable year of the Lord so that many will come to know you and that they will be rescued from their sinful lifestyle. Lord, I also come with a message that people here need to be the watchman on the wall. I believe, Lord God, that today there may be someone here that you call to be the next preacher or evangelist or missionary. There may be some young man or some young woman, Lord God, whose heart you're working on right now, preparing them to send them out into this world to be a spokesperson for you. God, I pray that from this generation you'll raise up an army of laborers for the harvest. And that as we approach Friend Day, Lord God, this opportunity to reach out to our community, that you would bring many, many, many people to a knowledge of your love and your mercy and your salvation. And we just ask it all in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Sound the alarm. A while ago, we had a little alarm went off. It goes off every Sunday morning. <laughs> At about 10.30, it's a little bell that we have. It's not a fire alarm, but it is time to say, uh, it is there to say it's time to move from your Sunday school class
to the worship service. Many of you have fire alarms, smoke alarms, burglar alarms in your home. Those alarms go off for a reason. It's to alert you to danger that may be looming. You have alarms on your phones. You have alarm clocks to wake you up by your bed. Alarms are there for many different things. Isaiah chapter 58. We looked at Isaiah a couple of weeks ago. Here's what he said. He says, cry aloud, spare not, and lift up your voice like a trumpet. He says, sound the alarm. He says, there is impending judgment coming for those who are living in sin and iniquity. But there's a good news. There is a gospel. There is a message that we need to proclaim. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Are we lifting up our voice like a trumpet? Are we sounding the alarm like we should? Or are we going to sit back and say, I'm not responsible for what happens next? I'm not obligated to tell anyone of the good news and the message of the Lord Jesus Christ that I myself have received in my life. What do we need to give the warning? First of all, just like Ezekiel here, we need to have a message. Point number one, you've got to have the message. Here's the message, ABC. You need to admit that you're a sinner. You need to believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. You need to confess him as your Lord and Savior. The message is all about the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ for the sins of mankind. What was Ezekiel's message? He said, the sword is about to fall. God said, it's not an enemy that's going to bring it. God said, I'm the one that's going to bring the judgment. And I'm giving you a fair warning. I'm giving you a chance. I'm giving you an opportunity to repent. He says, when I bring, when I bring the sword upon a land. And the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman. When he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, and whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning. Listen, folks, it's not our responsibility to make people respond to the message. It is only our responsibility to deliver the message. And once we have delivered the message and we have done what God has asked us to do, it is then up to his Holy Spirit to move in the life of that person. The warning trumpet. Cry aloud, spare not, and lift up your voice like a trumpet, like Isaiah said. Ezekiel here says that when the watchman sees the enemy coming, when he sees the sword of judgment calling, he is to sound a trumpet to alert the people. Look, we could go on for days and days and days talking about the use of trumpets in the Bible. Trumpets in those days, were, they were most likely a ram's horn. And each one was designed to make a certain pitch and a certain sound, depending on what they were wanting to alert the people for. They could be used simply for music, just to play a tune. They could be used as a summons to war. They could be used as a commencement to attack. It is time to charge the enemy. They could be used to commemorate a victory. We have won. Let's celebrate. Let's sound the alarm and let everybody know the battle is over and we have won. They are used to commemorate a, a special celebration or the arrival of royalty. Think about that. We've been learning about Jesus as prophet, priest, and king. He is royalty. He is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. And the Bible says that at his return, there's going to be several things that happens. First, we're going to hear a shout from the Lord, and then the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, announcing that royalty is coming. Also, that trumpet is going to sound because it is going to be signifying the church, God's bride, that's been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. It is time for the church to move. <laughs> the battle's over, folks. <laughs> we're out of here. When I hear the toot, I'm going to scoot. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to go. And I'm listening for that trumpet each and every day. Because I think the trumpeter, he's wetting his lips. He's getting ready. He's warming up and he's ready to blow that horn. Now, what is the shout of the Lord going to be? I don't know. I've said this before, but I think it's going to be this. <laughs> ready or not, here I come. Because whether you're ready or not, it doesn't matter to the Lord. The Lord says he's coming like a thief in the night, unannounced. No man knows the time or the day. On, not even the angels in heaven, only my Father is what Jesus said. So whether you're ready or not, when that trumpet sounds, 
Jesus is coming back and the bride of Christ is going to rise to meet him in the air. Trumpets were also used for rejoicing. Revelation chapter 1 verse 10, John describes the voice of Jesus. He said, I heard a voice behind me like a loud trumpet. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 14, 8, that if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? That's why Isaiah says to cry aloud and spare not and lift up your voice like a trumpet. We have a message to proclaim, and we need to proclaim it loud and clear. We have heard the trumpet sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. And that's the message that we need to bring. Folks, it is time to sound the trumpet. Because the sword is about to fall on our land. God is a patient God. He is a loving God. He is a caring God. But at some point in time, he's going to draw a line in the time of sin. And he's going to say, that's it. I've had enough. You've had your opportunity and you wasted it. Now it's time for me to begin my process of ending this world as we know it. Bear the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the waves. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Brothers and sisters, I, I don't know how to make it any clearer. This world is going to hell in a handbasket. Our culture is no longer on a slippery slope. It has fallen, and it has fallen hard. All you have to do is get up and turn on the television or open up your newspaper or even go to social media, and you'll fully understand the depravity of our culture today. And how lost it is. Millions lost in darkness who have never heard about Jesus Christ. What once used to be done in the shadows, under the darkness of night, in the back alleys in our culture is now dressed up and paraded right down Main Street for everybody to see. Yet we as Christians choose to sit back and silently uh, fail to sound the warning. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 through 38. And here's what I'm calling for today. We need people to go out with the message and tell others that Jesus saves. We need people that will go out and invite them to come into God's house to hear a gospel-centered message that Jesus saves. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 through 30, and this is something I pray for frequently. This is something that we pray for every Wednesday night. Jesus said the harvest truly is plentiful. What does that mean? That means within your area of influence, Auburn subdivision, Lakeside subdivision, Wyandotte, Amelia, anywhere you can think of, there are lost people. There is a harvest of souls waiting for us to share the message that Jesus saves. Jesus said, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Would you stand up today and be accounted for? and Say, God, I want to be a part of your harvest. I want to share the good news with others because what this world needs right now is a little good news. Jesus said, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Not only does God need a message to send out, he's already provided that. But to sound the alarm... To give the warning, there must first be a message. Do you know how to share the message of Jesus Christ with other people? Just tell them what you know. You, you don't need some theological dissertation. You don't have to have a prepared speech. 
If you can memorize just a small handful of verses, if you could take a Bible with you and read them, if you can take a gospel track and give it to someone, you have that message that you can bring to other people. Pray the Lord of harvest to send out laborers into his harvest, to take that message. What God needs next is a messenger. Not only does we, do we have to have a message, but we have to have a messenger. Ezekiel 33, 7, God says, warn them for me. We need a messenger to go out and warn people. Hell is hot, heaven's sweet, God is good, and Jesus saves. <laughs> We need somebody to go out and proclaim that. We need a messenger to take that message to anyone and everyone they possibly can. David Jeremiah, in his commentary on this particular passage, had this to say. He says, and I quote, God has placed upon every Christian the responsibility of being a watchman, end quote. So what would the watchman do? What were his responsibilities? First, he was to observe just watch what's going on around you. Is there danger looming? Is there something out of the ordinary? But more specifically for us, is there something happening in our area that is ungodly, unchristlike? Just observe. That's the first thing that a watchman needs is a good set of eyes to see what's going on around him. A good set of ears to listen to what's coming across on the news. How can I tell people that this is not God's will for our country and our culture right now? The next thing that a watchman needed to be, he needed to remain alert. Don't fall asleep. Don't get complacent. Don't be lackadaisical. Because when you see danger looming, it is then time to respond to that. The watchman also needed to watch for anything suspicious or threatening. And last, the watchman, when he sees danger present, he is to sound the alarm. Don't remain silent about it. The watchman was given a responsibility for a whole city. You watch this one section. If you see anything out of the ordinary, if you see danger coming, you sound the alarm. You get on your horn and your trumpet and you blow and you let everyone know, hey, there's danger coming. Be ready. Prepare yourself. Is there anyone here who's observed changes in our world today? Do you see what's going on around us? Does it sadden your heart that people are acting and responding the way that they are? When you see things going on on the news, does it break your heart? Does God try to motivate you and get you out and say, I want you to be a messenger. I want you to do something about this. Four days into her maiden voyage, April 15, 1912, the HMS Titanic struck an iceberg and sank. There were three specific messages that were sent prior to that. Warning, there's icebergs in the area. Not just once, not just twice, but three times, the same message. Use caution. Proceed carefully. There have been icebergs spotted in your area. However, choosing to ignore the warnings, the captain said, full speed ahead. We've got passengers to deliver. We've got a record that we want to set. No matter what those warnings say, we're going to continue to move on. However, when he chose to ignore those warnings, The result, 1,500 people lost their lives. The three warnings that were given came true. And when they saw the iceberg, it was too late. You've seen the movie. You've read about it. You know what happened. That's not the worst tragedy of all, though. Even though those warnings were ignored, here's the second tragedy that took place on that night. The second tragedy was that there were not enough lifeboats sufficient to hold all the passengers on the ship. They had hurriedly set sail 
and didn't complete the task of manning enough lifeboats on the ship for all the passengers on board. And so there were many passengers left aboard a sinking ship once all the lifeboats were lowered into the water. The third tragedy that happened on that night was that the few lifeboats that were available were not filled to capacity. They could have taken more passengers on board the lifeboat. And the lifeboats could have even came back after the passengers were in the water, but they were afraid that they would pull on the sides of the lifeboats and tip them over and more lives would have been lost. The warning was given. The provisions were not there to help people. And they didn't come back for the survivors. Folks, look around right now. There's a lifeboat. There's a lifeboat. We have lifeboats that are empty right here in our own facility. We have room for more passengers. We have room to help rescue people right here. Are we going to heed the warning and are we going to take the message into our lost community and tell them don't go down with the ship. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And God says if you'll invite them in and if the name of Jesus is lifted up and if the gospel message is clearly presented, those people can be saved just like you were. But now is the time to sound the alarm. We have a message. What we need now is messengers who will say, I hear what you're saying, Brother Tracy. I, I see what's going on. I, I see that the sword of judgment is about to fall on our nation. And I'm ready to go and share the good news with people that Jesus saves. Because the next thing that we need is a motivation. What is it that motivates you? Or what is God going to have to do to motivate you to open your mouth and proclaim the good news to someone? There are certain risks of being a watchman. Verse 10 says, uh, Son of man, say to the house of Israel, If our transgressions and our sins lie upon us, we pine away with them. How can we live? When you go out and you proclaim to people, are they going to always accept your offering? No, most likely not. Most people say that some people have to hear the gospel multiple times before it penetrates their heart. Maybe you're sitting here today. You've been to a church service before. You've been through an invitation before. God has pulled at your heart. He's knocking on your heart's door right now. Maybe you've stood during the invitation time and you've had a death grip on the back of the pew and you said, I'm not going to do it today. Let me ask you this. Why not? Why not today? Why not allow God's Holy Spirit to motivate you to respond to the gospel message? And if you are here today and you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you are saved and that heaven is your home, why are you not sharing that message with someone else? And what is it going to take to motivate you to do that? I will give you some warnings, though. There are some risks involved in being a watchman, being a messenger, being one who proclaims that Jesus saves. First of all, people are going to call you an alarmist. Huh? You, you don't know what you're talking about. People have been saying Jesus is coming back for hundreds of years. I've heard it all my life. He's not coming back. You're just an alarmist. You're trying to scare me into making a decision. That's what some people will say when you decide to become a watchman on the wall. Some people will say, oh, you're just a religious zealot. You're trying to be high and mighty and holier than thou. That could be said about you as well. You could suffer from rejection. People won't want to be around you. You could suffer from ridicule. They'll pick on you and mock you and make fun of you. Here's the motivation. Here's what we need to focus on. Here's Jesus' parting words. He says, go ye therefore into all the world. That little two-letter word right there, G-O, it's a verb. It is an action word. That means you are to be motivated to do something. 
Go into all the world and preach the gospel. The book of Mark says this in its closing chapter. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. And he who does not believe will be condemned. 1 John chapter 5 says that he who has a son has life. He who does not have a son does not have life. I tell people this all the time. Either you is or you ain't. <laughs> There's no middle ground. There's no in between. There's no hope so, think so, or possibly I could make it to heaven. If you have put your life and your faith and your hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you should be able to know and proclaim beyond a shadow of a doubt, God is my Father, Jesus is my Savior, heaven is my home, end of story. And if you can't confidently say that, then you need to get saved today. Because you're headed straight to hell. The sword of judgment is going to fall upon you at some point in time. But Jesus says this here as well. He says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. And he who does not believe will be condemned. That should be your motivation to share the good news with other people. Hey, are you condemned or are you saved? Do you know Jesus or do you not know Jesus? The book of Matthew also records this same commission to go out, this motivation to go and share the good news. But it comes with a promise also. Because you may be sitting here today and say, Brother Trey, I, I want to share my faith, but I am scared to death. Here's the promise that Jesus gives. It should help you with that. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20 states, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded. And here's the promise. Here's your motivation. He says, Lo, I am with you always. So when you open your mouth to proclaim the message, when you open your mouth to give the warning, it's not you that's speaking. It is God that is speaking through you because Jesus says he will be with you during that time and he'll give you the words to say. Here's another motivation. The motivation is to one day stand before the Lord and God says, turn around and look. And you just see hundreds of people and God says, that's your reward right there. They are here because of you. And all I want to hear when I stand before the Lord is to hear this, well done, my good and faithful servant. Why do I get excited when I preach? Why do I get excited about sharing the gospel with other people? Because of that right there. I'm not looking to get a pat on the back from you. I'm not looking for you to say good sermon on the way out the door. I'm looking at the end of this message for God to say, you did exactly what I wanted you to do. Well done. And when you share the gospel with someone else, that's what God is going to say to you as well. Well done. Thank you for telling someone about my son Jesus. And thank you for telling them that Jesus saves. That is your motivation. Here's my challenge to you today. I'm going to get up in your grill for just a minute. It's not going to hurt you one bit when you do this. And as far as I know, I have provided every person here with enough resources to go out and do personal evangelism. Most of the times during my invitations, I'm sharing the gospel, the Roman roads, and I do it repeatedly for your benefit so that you will understand and you will remember those verses. On the back of your outline, turn it over just a minute, and I want you to write the letters A, B, and C. Here's how you can share the gospel. It goes a lot further than this, but this is a good place to start. A, admit. The Bible says in, in Romans 3.23 that there are none righteous, no, not one. And it also says that we have all sinned and we've fallen short of the glory of God. The first thing you need to do is get that person to admit, hey, I've got a sin problem and I need a Savior. 
Because you're not going to understand that you need a Savior until you understand what the problem is. So they need to first admit that they have a problem with sin. B, believe. Believe that Jesus died as your substitute. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Openly and publicly. Jesus did nothing in private. When he called his disciples, he did it publicly. When he died, he did it publicly. So if you're going to say, I'm an undercover Christian, that's baloney. <laughs> the Bible doesn't teach that. Jesus says, whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father which is in heaven. So first you need to admit. Second, you need to believe that Jesus died as your sin substitute. And the third thing that they need to remember is they need to confess Confessing openly and confessing publicly. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. If you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now we have an event coming up on October 22nd. You can either take what I just told you and share with your lost friend, or you can take one of these invitations here in just a moment. I have plenty on the uh, pew in front of you. You can come down and take one or two of them. Take ten of them, however many you need. Now let me ask you something. Did it hurt you when I handed you that? It didn't hurt me either. <laughs> no harm done. This is time for us to be bold, folks. I'm challenging you. Find at least one person. That you can say, hey, come be my friend. Nine o'clock, I'll bring you to have coffee and donuts with the pastor, and I'll introduce you to him. Then we can go to Sunday school together. Then after church, I'm going to take you out to lunch on me, whatever it takes to get them here. And then you can say, later on that day, we're going to feed you again. Five o'clock, you come back and just fellowship with us. It's not going to hurt you one bit. And the worst thing they can do is say no. We need to sound the alarm, folks. We need to let people know that there is a sword of judgment coming upon our land. I think it's soon. I think what you see in our political realm, I think what you see going on in our culture, I think all the signs point to the sword of judgment falling upon our country at some point in time in the near future. Unless Jesus comes back before then, we've got a message Jesus saves. We need some messengers. We need some people that will say, I don't mind sharing my faith, and I want to know more about sharing my faith. There are literally dozens of books back in our library, and if you run out of books there, I've got more in my office that teach you about evangelism, how to do personal one-on-one -on -one ministering and witnessing. You have no excuse. We have no right to remain silent while this world goes to hell in a handbasket. We have a message. We need messengers. But I think what you need right now is a motivation. I'm going to close with this. You've heard it before, but it's something that keeps me going. And it was written a long time ago by the man of a. B., by the name of A.B. Simpson. Since then, since he wrote that, world population has grown substantially. But when he originally wrote it, he wrote this. He said, 100,000 souls a day are passing one by one away in Christless guilt and gloom. Without one ray of hope in sight, with future dark as endless night, they're passing to their doom. So to bring that poem up to date, you would have to change those numbers quite a bit. For the world population today, for that to be completely accurate, it would be more like this. 400,000 souls a day are passing one by one each day in Christless guilt and gloom. Think about that. Do you know someone that that poem is describing? With future dark as endless night, they're passing to their gloom. Cry aloud, spare not, and lift up your voice like a trumpet. Sound the alarm, let people know that Jesus saves. Where's your mission field at? Right outside those doors. 
As soon as you exit this building, you are stepping into one of the biggest mission fields around us. When you go eat at a restaurant, when you go to school tomorrow, when you go to work tomorrow, you are in the mission field. But if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to give you that opportunity to respond. As a musician comes to the piano, as we get ready to sing our closing hymn, I want you to close your eyes and bow your heads for just a moment. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? If you died today, where would you spend eternity at? Could you honestly say that I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that God is my Father, Jesus is my Savior, and heaven is my home? Or are you here today with a hope so or think so knowledge of salvation? If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if you've never taken that step of faith and asked him to come in your heart, to forgive you of your sins, and give you a new life, let today be that day. The Bible says that if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have become new. And the Bible says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of all of our sins. Won't you ask him into your heart today? Won't you step out of that pew into this aisle and take me by the hand and say, Brother Tracy, I don't know Jesus. I don't know where I'd spend eternity, but I want to know for sure. And I'll help you do that. As Christians across this sanctuary are praying right now, as the music begins, let's all stand. Eyes closed, heads bowed, 